intracranial pressure and intracranial pressure is going to be elevated in what kind of scenarios for your step two? Uh, usually it's an older person okay. um, who is, who have non, um, non-communicating hydrocephalus. Okay, good. So uh, increased intracranial pressure could yeah. be due to hydrocephalus on your exam, okay. right? And that could yeah. be um, either acquired or congenital, right? Yeah. Increased intracranial pressure could also be due to trauma. Trauma, after, after trauma, yeah. Yeah, exactly. The other cause of increased intracranial pressure could be mass, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, these USMLE scenarios are actually very important for you to recognize. And Mm -hmm. in order for us to kind of get at the questions that they will ask, we have to develop a general framework as to what builds up the contents in our brain. Mm -hmm. So if we think about our skull as a box, this box has three different things. It has the brain tissue. Mm -hmm. It has the CSF, and it has blood, correct? Mm -hmm. These are the three components that are going to make up your skull. And as you can agree with me, any changes in either CSF, blood, or brain, you can get the alteration of these compartments and subsequently increased intracranial pressure. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this hydrocephalus that we talked about, right? The hydrocephalus that we talked about, that is all related to CSF building up, right? And there are things such as communicating hydrocephalus in which they can put a USMLE scenario that a patient had, for example, radiation to their brain. And essentially, they develop this communicating hydrocephalus because of the effect of radiation on Mm -hmm. their, uh, the effect of radiation on their choroid uh, plexus and the arachnoid villi. Mm -hmm. The other kind of hydrocephalus is the non-communicating hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. And that non-communicating hydrocephalus could be due to some sort of mass effect or obstruction. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think about the um, compartment of blood, the scenarios that we think of is, yes, trauma, but also we think about hemorrhagic strokes, Mm -hmm. in which if you had a bleeding blood vessel, such as due to an AVM, or a cavernous malformation, Mm -hmm. you are going to have alterations in the blood compartment, thus leading to increased renal pressure. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, you can have the brain tissue grow and cause you to have increased intracranial pressure. And that Mm -hmm. is all going to be related to edema. Now, that edema could be due to trauma. Remember that USMLE scenarios about um, uh, trauma could be like either from an automobile accident or them falling right? Or maybe Mm -hmm. a football game or something like that. But it could also be due to like a tumor, right? So for example, an elderly patient presenting with a very malignant glioblastoma multiforme, which is going to be a supratentorial tumor, compared Mm -hmm. to your pediatric patients on your exam that could have infratentorial masses. Mm -hmm. Again, this can alter the brain side of things. Mm -hmm. So then what we have to really delve into is, okay, so what are going to be the things in the exam questions that are going to point towards increased intracranial pressure? So what are some clues to increase intracranial pressure in exams? Um, uh, Winning, um, headache, vomiting. Excellent. So headache right? Because there's something that is, you know, this fixed skull that you have, things are compressing and that's causing pain. Yeah. Things such as vomiting. Sure. Right? If, if it's a uh, um, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is uh, after, after trauma or after it's uh, elderly people. And then there are also um, urine leakage. Yes, exactly. Yep. So, uh, so yes, when you're, when you're talking about hydrocephalus, you can put normal pressure hydrocephalus in Mm -hmm. there. Good. Now 
Vomiting is really important. Remember that this vomiting could be projectile. This is because of the fact that your brain osmolarity is altered when mm -hmm. you have some sort of mass or when you have some sort of increased uh, pressure. And to relieve that pressure, think of the vomiting as a compensatory response. But vomiting is extremely important for you to recognize. Yeah. And early morning headaches um, as well. Number three, I would say, is things such as papilledema, mm -hmm. in which you have the blurring of your optic discs. Number four, you are thinking of any focal neurologic deficit. Mm -hmm. So these are all going to be clues that, oh my gosh, there's some sort of increased intracranial pressure that is going on. And your USMLE questions are really going to be focusing on, okay, what are the next best steps in management? And usually that next best steps in management are going to be these acute things you need to do. Now, with the focal neurological changes, remember one of the things that you can see as an early sign of increased intracranial pressure is pupillary changes, mm -hmm. in which you are going to have one pupil that might be big and dilated, secondary to the compression of cranial nerve number three, the parasympathetics that are mm -hmm. surrounding cranial nerve number three. Or you could have actual changes in terms of your eye movements. So pupil slash eye changes are also one of the most stark findings that they will put on your exam question. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about the acute management of intracranial pressure, you have to be thinking of, okay, how can I alter my CSF? How can I alter my blood? How can I uh, alter my brain? And how can I alter the pieces in my skull? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go through things. So in terms of acute management, one of the first things that you can do with intracranial pressure is number one, raise the head of the bed. And what mm -hmm. does that do? Because gravitation. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. of gra gravity causing a good amount of venous drainage. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you can do, and it depends on whether the patient is intubated or um, spontaneously breathing, is induce hyperventilation. Yeah, and yeah. Now, what, why does that help? Because hyperventilation is, um, uh, it will help the um, spasm of the, the, of the. You got it. So it, yeah. it's going to help cerebral vasoconstriction. Yeah, vasoconstriction. I forgot that word. Yeah, no worries. So yeah, cerebral vasoconstriction is extremely yeah. important when you're talking about reducing intracranial pressure. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that you can also do is give hypertonic saline. Saline. Yeah. And hypertonic saline, we also uh, call 3% normal saline. Normal saline. And this is going to be a hyperosmolar solution. This, as well as mannitol, is a hyperosmolar solution in which you are going to place it in the blood space. And mm -hmm. when you place it in the blood space, it is going to pull in any excess amount of free water that you have in your neuronal cells. And that is thus going to reduce mm -hmm. the amount of intracranial pressure. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you can do is call the neurosurgeons and place what we call a burr hole. And that yeah. burr hole as well as EVD, external ventricular drain, is how we are going to alter the skull component of your, of your brain, or of your vault. And that skull component, if you place a little bit of an EVD or a burr hole, that's going to relieve the amount of pressure. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the summary of increased intracranial pressure for your uh, step two exam. Again, mm -hmm. head of elevation, giving sedation in order to decrease the cerebral metabolic oxygen uh, demand of the brain, giving hypertonic solution, hyperventilation, or subsequently removing the amount mm -hmm. of CSF. Mm -hmm.